while scrolling through Twitter, I stumbled upon this website showcasing a stunning footer animation where the images are dynamically scattering into view, almost like a confetti explosion. It instantly caught my attention as a fun challenge to recreate, so I decided to rebuild this effect using Next.js without relying on any external animation libraries. Since the last few videos have been in vanilla JavaScript, I thought it was time to bring Next.js back into the mix. And this project was the perfect opportunity. You can see I've set up a simple page with a footer and as you scroll down, the animation kicks in. For this one, we'll be incorporating some basic physics behavior like gravity, friction, force, etc. to make the motion feel natural and dynamic. And to make it even more interactive, we'll ensure that the animation resets when you scroll back up and trigger it again. If you'd like me to cover more animations like this in Next.js, give this video a like and consider subscribing if you haven't already. For pro members, I've also included a vanilla JavaScript version of this effect which you can unlock via the link in the description. Alright, let's dive into the code. To save some time, I've already set up a fresh Next.js app and got it running on my local server. Now let's start by cleaning up the boilerplate code so we can have a clean slate to work with. First, I'll head over to the globals.css file and remove everything inside it. Next, I'll do the same for the page.module.css file, clearing out all the default styles. Now let's move on to the home page and remove everything from the existing markup so we can start adding our own HTML structure. For this project, I'll create three sections, hero, about and an outro. I'll also add a footer, which is crucial for the animation we'll be implementing. For now, I'll leave all the sections empty since we'll be setting their background images later. But in the about section, I'll add some placeholder text just to ensure that the page doesn't look completely blank. For the footer, I'll include an h1 with some dummy text and a div with the class name copyright info which will contain a couple of paragraph elements just so it doesn't feel empty. That's all we need for the HTML structure. Now let's add our assets. I'll navigate to the public folder and create a new folder called assets where I'll place 15 images for this effect. You can add more or fewer based on your preference. Alright, with the HTML in place, let's move on to styling. To keep everything consistent, I'm removing all margins and padding and setting up a box sizing rule so that the elements don't get affected by extra spacing. Next, for all paragraph elements, I'm making the text uppercase and using a clean monospace font for a minimal look. For images, I am ensuring that they scale properly by setting them to take up the full width and height of their container while keeping their aspect ratio intact using a cover property. Now let's style the sections. Each section will take up the full width and height of the viewport with some padding for spacing. The hero section will have a background image applied and set to cover the entire section by staying centered. For the about section, I am giving it a solid off-white background and centering its content both vertically and horizontal using flexbox. The paragraph inside will be positioned in the center and take up only half of the available space so it doesn't stretch across the full width. The outro section follows the same structure as the hero section but with a different background image. Now for the footer, I'm making it full width and setting its height slightly shorter than the viewport. It has a dark background with white text for contrast. To keep everything structured, I'm using Flexbox to space out the content and align it properly. The footer heading is designed to be large and bold using a custom font. It's also set to uppercase with a tight line height to keep it looking clean and professional. Below that, the copyright info is positioned at the bottom of the footer, it's spaced evenly to make sure it looks balanced. Finally, we have the explosion animation setup. The explosion container is positioned at the bottom of the footer, taking up extra height to allow for movement. It won't interfere with any user interaction since pointer events are set to none. Inside this container, each explosion particle starts off screen and is positioned at the bottom. The images are small in size, centered properly and optimized for smooth animation. That wraps up the styling setup. Now let's move on to creating the explosion container component. 
To set this up, I'll first create a components folder inside the source directory. Then inside it, I'll add a new file called explosioncontainer.js. This will be a simple functional component that returns a div with the class name explosion container, which will act as the container for our animation. It's important to export the component so we can easily import and use it in our page. I'll open the page.js file, import the component and place it inside the footer, making sure it's properly placed for the effect. Now that we have the structure in place, we are all set to bring this component to life. We'll start by adding use client directive at the top of the file. This tells Next.js that this component should be treated as a client side component since we'll be using state, effects, and event listeners. Next, we import a few important React hooks. Use effect for handling side effects like attaching event listeners and managing animations. Use ref to create persistent references to DOM elements. Use state to track whether the explosion animation has already been triggered so we don't run it multiple times unnecessarily. Now let's define our refs and state variables. First, we create a reference for the explosion container using use ref which allows us to interact with it directly in the DOM. Next, we create another reference for the footer since we need to track when it comes into view to trigger the explosion. Then, we define a state variable called explosion triggered. This will help us ensure that the animation doesn't restart while it's still running. We also create a reference called particles ref which will store all the individual exploding image particles so we can update them in the animation. Finally, let's apply the explosion container ref to the HTML container. Now that we have set up our references, let's define the configuration settings for the effect. These values will control the physics and behavior of the animation, ensuring the particles move realistically when they scatter. First, we have gravity which is set to 0.25. This means that as the particles move, they will gradually be pulled downward, simulating the natural effect of gravity. Next, we have friction set to 0.99. This slightly slows down the particles over time, preventing them from moving indefinitely and making the motion feel natural. Then we define the image size which is 150 pixels for movement. We have horizontal force set to 20 and vertical force set to 15. The horizontal force controls how much the particles spread out to the sides while the vertical force controls how high they initially jump before falling back down due to gravity. Next, we have the rotation speed which is set to 10. This determines how much the images spin while moving, adding a more dynamic feel to the animation. And finally, we have reset delay set to 500 milliseconds. This introduces a short delay before allowing another explosion to be triggered, preventing the animation from being spammed. After setting up these physics properties, we define a total number of particles in the explosion which is set to 15. Then we create an array of image paths dynamically generating file names like image1.jpg, image2.jpg and so on up to image15.jpg. This will be images used in the explosion effect. With our physics and image setup complete, we are now ready to start creating the particles themselves. To do this, we create a particle class which will control the movement and physics of each image particle in the explosion. Inside the constructor, we take in an HTML element which represents one of the image particles. Next, we set up the initial position of the particle by defining x and y both starting at zero, meaning each particle will originate from the same point. To make sure the particles scatter in different directions, we introduce velocity variables. Vx is the horizontal velocity which is randomly assigned a value between negative and positive half of the horizontal force. This ensures that some particles move left while others move right. Vy is the vertical velocity which starts with an upward push based on the vertical force along with an additional random value to create natural variation. We also define rotation and rotation speed which determine how much each particle spins as it moves. The rotation speed is assigned a small random value so that every particle rotates at a slightly different rate. Next, we create an update function which will be responsible for animating each particle on every frame. Inside this function, we apply real world physics calculations. First, we increase the vertical velocity by the gravity value making the particles fall over time. Then, we apply friction to both the horizontal and vertical velocities as well as the rotation speed. This gradually slows down the movement preventing the particles from flying around indefinitely. Once the velocities are updated, we move the particle by adjusting its x and y values then apply a rotation transformation to make it spin dynamically. Finally, if the particle has a valid HTML element, we apply the transformation using CSS, positioning the particle based on the updated x and y values and the rotation values. Now that we have the logic for individual particles, let's move on to generating them inside the explosion container. To do that, we create the create particles function 
First, we check if the explosion container exists. If not, we exit the function to avoid errors. Then, we clear any previous particles inside the container and reset the particle reference array to ensure that we are not storing old elements. Next, we loop through our image paths and dynamically create image elements for each particle. We assign each one the explosion particle class and set its width to mesh our configuration. Once the particles are created, we grab all of them from the container and convert them into particle objects, storing them into an array so we can animate them later. Now that we have the explosion particles set up, we are ready to trigger the animation when the effect is activated. To do this, we define an explode function. First, we check if the explosion has already been triggered. If it has, we write away return to prevent the animation from running multiple times at once. If the explosion hasn't been triggered yet, we set the flag to true to mark it as active. Next, we call the create particles function which generates and positions the images inside the explosion container. Now let's handle the actual animation loop. We define two variables, animation ID which will store the request animation frame ID so we can control when to stop the animation, finished which is initially set to false will determine when the explosion effect has completed. Inside the animate function, we first check if the animation is finished. If it is, we return early to prevent further updates, otherwise we loop through each particle and call its update function, applying physics calculations to move and rotate them. Next, we check if all particles have fallen past a certain height inside the explosion container. If they have, we stop the animation by cancelling the animation frame. Once the animation is complete, we introduce a short reset delay using set timeout. After this delay, we set explosion triggered flag back to false, allowing the effect to be triggered again when the user scrolls back down. Finally, if the animation is still ongoing, we request the next animation frame to continue updating particle positions, keeping the effect smooth and responsive. Now that our explosion effect is fully functional, let's move on to detecting when the footer comes into view so we can trigger it automatically. So we'll define the check footer position function. First, we check if the footer exists. If it doesn't, we return right away to avoid errors. Next, we use getBoundingClientRect method to get the position of the footer relative to the viewport. Then, we compare the top of the footer with the viewport height to see if it has moved into view. If the footer is visible and the explosion hasn't already been triggered, we call explode function to start the animation. Now let's integrate this function into our use effect hook which runs when the component mounts. First, we preload all the explosion images so they are ready to go when the effect is triggered. Then, we select the footer element and store it in footer ref so we can track its position. Next, we call create particles method to ensure our explosion container is properly set up before the animation starts. Now, we need to detect scroll events. We create a handle scroll function that uses set timeout to check the footer's position with a slight delay. This prevents unnecessary function calls and improves performance. Then, we attach a scroll event listener to the window, so check footer position runs whenever the user scrolls. To make sure the animation is properly triggered when the page loads, we also call check footer position after a small delay. Next, we add a resize event listener which resets the explosion trigger when the screen size changes. Finally, inside the cleanup function, we remove both event listeners and clear the timeout when the component unmounts, preventing memory leaks. With this setup, the explosion animation will trigger automatically when the footer comes into view and will reset properly when needed. So that was it. Hope you found the video helpful. See you in the next one.